Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here to follow up on that very, be part of the follow-up panel of that very interesting uh, session that we've already had. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Switzerland's approach, but actually more about what, where we're participating on an international level. So um, we are one of the countries that does not have a strategy on AI, just to make that clear for the time being. Why? Because we do have something else that we've been having for the last 20 years. We've been updating it every two years. It's been called now for a few years Digital Switzerland Strategy uh, that outlines some of the basic goals and principles, makes reference to some fundamental texts like the Constitution and other things where you already have some basic values and principles. And uh, we think that these basically apply also to AI. Uh, some of the, uh, these elements are putting people first, of course, providing room for innovation and development. Structural change needs to somehow be managed and facilitated. And we are convinced that this is not a government only top down or government and the industry only thing, but it's something where all stakeholders should be involved, in particular also civil society, of course, academia, in order to jointly work as networks, work in networks to manage all of this to the good and avoid the bad to the extent possible. So in this uh, last Digital Switzerland strategy of last September, um, there is one specific goal that uh, refers to AI that basically says, yeah, this is something that uh, has at least new elements uh, that may require us to look a little bit closer into, into the issues. And uh, the decision of that strategy was then to do what uh, you normally do as a government in such a, an occasion when something new comes up. You establish a working group. In the case of Switzerland, it's normally an interdepartmental working group where you have several people from several ministries, departments and federal offices mandated, of course, by the government to write a report. So that report, um, it took about a year to write that. Um, I was part of that working group. It's called Challenges of Artificial Intelligence and was presented uh, to the government and then published last December. And here are some of the key findings that the, the, the group of people that uh, uh, elaborated the report uh, found was that in general, Switzerland is well positioned with regard to AI, economically, also legally, and so on, that in particular, the legal framework as well is generally suitable also to deal with most of the issues and challenges related to AI, because uh, this is one of the, of the uh, let's say, basic assumptions of the functions of our system is that you agree on general principles and then you apply them accordingly to, subst uh, to, to, to substantive areas where developments may change, but that doesn't mean that you have to revise the basic principles every two years. So, um, but of course, that doesn't mean that we don't need to do uh, anything. We identified a number of areas where it's necessary to have a closer look and see how things develop. And in case there's a necessity for action, uh, i.e. regulation, then we should be prepared um, to do so. One, of course, was uh, looking into how the development of international law in multilateral institutions is changed through a technological change, through the power of big companies um, that have more knowledge, more experience, more resources than governments. Uh, that has an impact on, on how de facto uh, international law is not just interpreted, but also new laws are, are created. Another, of course, important thing is, is the notion of the public sphere of democracy and media and the use of AI. And then a thing that is more inward looking, how do we use AI in, a, in, a, in an efficient, but also in a transparent, accountable and effective and, and reasonable, traceable way in the administration. And so the consequence is typically Swiss, no hyper, uh, hyperactivism. There's nothing that we need to do now so that the world doesn't go down, but we need to be very vigilant and active and we need to be prepared to take action if necessary. So that these are the key findings. And there's one thing um, that was also decided that the group will continue to work on what is called strategic guidelines on AI because um, uh, until spring, so in the next few months, this should be coming up. And um, that uh, there is a already existing uh, platform uh, that will be used to also share information, share, share views on AI, which is a platform that we created about 20 years ago in the preparation of the World Summit on the Information Society, because already there we felt that it's necessary to include businesses, civil society, academia in the discussion on what are the Swiss goals and values 
that we should defend uh, and, and argue for on international level. So this, this uh, existing structure will also be used. Um, and it is a structure that is open to everyone. So it is not a top-down decided thing. Anybody can just join uh, this thing and we'll have a thirst uh, meeting actually at the end of this week in, in Bern where about 55 people for, uh, for now have uh, registered and will come and discuss how do we deal, how should we keep up information exchange uh, on national level on these issues. Um, and now let's, let's, as I said, move to the international level because we are a fairly small country with about 80, uh, 8 million people. So we don't think that we can do everything on national level, but it's, it's actually very important that we are present in the global discussion about governance, not just on AI, but also on AI. And we are quite active in a number uh, of institutions um, that we will see on the following slides. And of course, uh, also there, what we defend is basically the, the same thing in all these institutions, no matter which government representative is there, that is, there should be room for innovation. These technologies should be uh, used to, to improve our lives. At the same time, we need to make sure that fundamental values and norms, uh, including human rights, of course, are respected. And again, the same principle, probably the best solution emerge if you have everybody at the table that should be at the table. So inclusiveness, multi-stakeholder approach, all stakeholders in their respective roles. This is something that, that for us is key on all levels, national, regional, and, and of course, on global level. So some of the institutions that are key for us in, in this regard, some of them have already been mentioned. The Council of Europe is, is a very exciting institution for those that are not from Europe. This is not uh, a structure of the European Union. This is a, an institution that has 47 member states, was built like the UN uh, after the Second World War, something like the UN for Europe. It has three pillars. One is human rights, the other is rule of law and democracy, and it has a court that actually is, is unique to this institution. So if your, uh, you think that your government, your state does not respect the rights that they signed up to by signing the European Human Rights Convention, you can actually sue your government in Strasbourg at the court and then the court will tell who's right or who's wrong. And if they think that your government didn't respect uh, your human rights, they urge the government not just to revoke the decision, but actually to modify a law if necessary, if they think that the law is not in conformity. So this is, um, and they have, um, several bodies that work on standard setting. One of them is, is, is the one that, one that I am participating in, uh, has uh, already developed uh, declarations on manipulative capacities of algorithmic processes. It's currently finalizing a recommendation on human rights impacts of, of, of AI and algorithmic processes. And there's a new thing which is now called the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on AI that has the task to uh, to, to present a feasibility study of a so-called legal framework for AI. <clears throat> that it comes out of a, of a ministerial conference of the Council of Europe from last um, May. In the beginning, they said a convention. Then they realized maybe there needs to be a set of tools. It can't just be a convention, but maybe a mix of hard and soft law. And this is a very exciting uh, initiative. We may have some time to discuss this later. Uh, in the OECD, we're also, we were part of the group that developed these principles, which are not economic principles, if you look at the OECD principles, but actually also ethical principles that they now had then had to develop an implementation guide that should help uh, implement these ethical principles. The ITU is also dealing with AI, but uh, less on a standard setting uh, basis, but more to try and foster cooperation. For instance, there's an AI uh, World Health or, uh, or WHO uh, group on AI in health and so on and so forth. And UNESCO is doing a similar thing like the Council of Europe does at the moment. They are setting up an expert group that is also starting to think about a legal framework for AI, which is then, of course, something that will be on global level. So these are the most important things. Maybe one thing that you may not be aware of, the UN Secretary General has launched uh, uh, some time ago, uh, a multi-stakeholder panel, high-level panel on digital cooperation that deals with digital governance and digital cooperation in general with a number of issues from security to human rights to development. And AI, of course, also there has some specific recommendations. And again, in our view, and this is what, we, what we've been fighting for in this, that there's not just substantive recommendations, but recommendations on the architecture of governance, where for us, again, the notion of not top-down uh, governance that in our view works less and less, but a networked architecture where all the actors that somehow have a role or should have a role or should have a say are connected 
in, in a way that nobody is falling off the table, no one is leaving behind, that, it, that people are also aware of non-intended consequences and that regulation or norms or whatever you may call them emerge that actually uh, maximize benefits and opportunities and minimize risks, not just for the ones that are at the table, but for also the people that are, are not there yet. Of course, Geneva plays an important role there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so I probably take up on some the, the end of the discussion from the last panel, and I think you probably wanted to answer some of those questions, but one of them was about incentives. And essentially, we talk about collaboration, we talk about working together, we want everybody to come on the table, but essentially, in the end of the day, there has to be an incentive structure that allows you to do that. And I think, personally, there's a role for policy to create those incentives. So I just like, and you know, we talk about taxes, but it could be investment, it could be many others. Um, it could actually be even awareness, because, you know, um, so that's very important. Is that something that you're thinking about? Is that something that you would like to prioritize? What is your view? Yeah, uh, I already alluded to it. We, we are strongly convinced that we may not solve the problems of the 21st century with the governance models of the 19th or 20th century when nation states were, were built and developed. So that we need new forms of multi-stakeholder co-governance uh, that may use a range of different tools to actually create the incentives. In some cases, it may be necessary to develop laws or conventions on international level. In other cases, it may not be possible because technology is moving too fast or because not everybody is willing to sign up. Then that means you need to identify other ways to create these incentives. One is just transparency, naming of shaming of governments, of companies, but also to create an environment where you identify common interests and it's, I would disagree with, with uh, the person that said the industry has no intent on regulation. In particular, the interesting thing is um, with the uprise of China, Silicon Valley has become much more, let's say, open to what they call meaningful or whatever regulation because regulation also give, can give some kind of security. It can also, let's say, help stabilize current divisions of power or of economic status. So there's a momentum that it also the UN uh, high level panel is trying to use, say, OK, we may not have everybody that agrees on regulation, but at least the ones that are willing to develop reasonable forms of regulation with mixes of soft law and self-regulation and some pressure. So we need to get the willing ones to work together and then see how far can we go. Okay. <clears throat> Another question. I know I should be diplomatic in front of you, but maybe no, I'm not don't. going to be. <laughs> so the question really relates to uh, something that I have heard uh, a lot, which is, you know, actually a complaint. Regulators are very slow. Regulators don't really understand what they're doing. You know, we give our submissions and half the time we get back comments which don't make sense because we think they don't understand. So you know, the question really is, um, what do you think should be done about, first of all, with your experience, um, you know, in, in within Switzerland, but also at the international fora, what is your feeling about that? And of course, you understand very well the needs uh, and, and what do you think the response is like and how quickly do you think we'll get that? And the second part of the question is, you know, what can we do about, even if that is a perception, what should we be doing about that? What can you do about that as a regulator? First of all, you're right, regulators are very slow and, and laws come late. Uh, but in, as, as I said, in, in my country, for instance, we still do not have a, a law that regulates the freedom of the press. We have an article in the constitution, the one line that says press freedom is guaranteed. That's it. And still we have something like a free press uh, uh, still now because there's a number of more or less sophisticated elements below, let's say, legal levels that work together in a way that things work and these are many times more dynamic so uh, in our culture we are we are normally only developing laws if we think that we can't solve it in a more agile in a more closer to the people and to the industry way and again i think we need to we need to be much more dynamic it has been said already dynamic and agile there may be some elements where you need to have binding conventions but again these in our view should be rather on a, on a general principle level and then you have to have structures that allow you to apply these principles to concrete cases with maybe specific guidance so that you can take decisions that you can create incentives for people and the industry and governments to behave in a certain way but not everything needs to be regulated let's say in a traditional way because that will probably not work okay 
very last question while I still have you here. It's about awareness, <laughs> because one of the things is that we want everybody to participate. But do you think today everybody is aware of what's happening, what these concerns are? I mean, are we doing enough to measure the impact of AI and then sharing it with a wider audience? Can government play a role in that so that we can help people to then join the debate? Is that something? Well, obviously, not not everybody is aware. I think nobody is aware of everything because things are just too too complex. But the awareness is growing rapidly, also uh, among people like politicians, for instance, that start to understand that whenever something is in the media, and it may be important, and then they they and, and they get to it. So again, this is also a shared exercise, and and different uh, actors have to have different roles. But yeah, we, of course, we need to do much more to to raise the awareness. But then again, also not everything is new that has a new name or it doesn't even have a new name, but just new pictures in the media articles or uh, new, new images in, in the TV. So we don't have, I'm a historian, this is maybe also why I say it, uh, and an economist, not, not a lawyer. Um, so I have no incentive in creating new laws, but actually understanding what's going on. And, and not everything is new. There are some elements that we had to deal with in slightly different ways, maybe or in different ways before, but you can still draw on some elements and say, okay, why don't we think about it in a similar way and realize what is really new and focus on that one, but take the existing rules for what is not new. And that helps sometimes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your intervention. And I'm sure we'll have questions for you later on in the panel. Great. <laughs>